What are you willing to sacrifice for the truth? Hello, hello everyone. Wow, we've got quite a crowd here today and I see a couple of familiar faces. Hi, welcome, welcome to the Philippine launch of How to Stand Up to a Dictator, the latest book of Rappler CEO and 2021 Nobel Peace Prize laureate Maria Ressa. I'm Pauline Makaraeg, I'll be your host for today. All right. I'm Pauline Makaraeg. I'm a digital forensics researcher at Rappler. We are so delighted to have, with you, uh, to have you with us today. Um, so before we start the event, just to formally start it, I will uh, say a couple, of, uh, a couple of reminders. So in your social media posts, please don't forget to include our hashtags, hashtag courage on and hashtag hold the line. Um, please also observe health safety measures. Uh, so just wear your mask uh, during the program. That's it. You can also avail of the free coffee pala um, at the back, um, courtesy of our friends from BPI. Um, if you still haven't, you can also purchase uh, a copy of your book. We have a fully booked booth at the back, um, but due to the limited number of uh, copies, each guest can only have one copy each. But don't worry, if you want to purchase additional copies, you can pre-order via the fully booked website. Um, I already said this earlier, but I'll take this opportunity again to say this, that we need more people standing up for fearless and independent journalism. So if you wish to support Rappler's journalism, um, please join Rappler Plus. We have a booth at the back. Just visit it later um, after the program. Um, by becoming a member, you get full access to our content. Um, we also get invites to act to members only events like this book launch and um, you also gain an insider experience uh, of our newsroom so if you are already a member which i know many of you are here um, and i heard that many many guests have signed up for a rapper plus membership earlier today um, and you just wish to share the gift of a Rappler Plus membership with your family and friends, please do head uh, again to our booth at the back. And, uh, 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 sorry, um, please head to the Rappler booth at the back. It's our way of linking arms with each other um, as we support independent journalism and as we fight for facts. Um, I know you're all excited now to hear from our Rappler CEO and Nobel Laureate, Maria Ressa. But to keep you more excited, we have with us today um, Sir Jose Butch Dalisay, an award-winning writer, a long-time professor at the University of the Philippines, and an activist to share his takeaways after reading Maria's book. Let's give him a warm round of applause. Thank you very much, and a pleasant afternoon to to all of you, and then happens in your lahat. It's good to see old friends. I'm very honored to be speaking at this launch of Maria Ressa's new book, How to Stand Up to a Dictator, The Fight for Our Future. I was privileged to have read an advanced copy of it a couple of weeks ago. And to cut to the chase, if you're thinking of buying a book to read for the holidays or to gift to friends, look no further. This book, for me, is among, if not the year's best in nonfiction. <laughs> I, I have to emphasize that word, nonfiction. As we all know, we live in times when fiction has taken over as the most important for, influential form of human discourse, particularly in the political arena. As a practicing fictionist, I should be happy about that, but I'm not and I can't be because so much of it is bad fiction, crudely written, and surprisingly, infuriatingly effective, at least with a certain kind of reader. Maria's book cuts through all that. It's undisguised, old-fashioned, in-your-face truth-telling told in the same voice and tone we become familiar with over the years of listening to her reportage on CNN. I'm sure that, like me, 
Many of you wondered the first time you heard her. Who was this little brown-complexioned woman speaking with an American accent? She looked Filipino, but how come we'd never seen her before? This was all before she rose to prominence, some will say notoriety, as the moving spirit behind Rappler, and subsequently to global fame as a Nobel Prize winner for peace. We identified with her travails, shared her anger and sadness at the abuse she has received, and rejoiced in her victories, whether in the courts or in the larger sphere of public opinion. But how well do we really know Maria Ressa and whatever drives her to be who and what she is? This book takes us to the person behind the phenomenon and answers many questions we may have had about her and her stubborn advocacies. The book's title, How to Stand Up to a Dictator, sounds like that of an instruction manual, which it is and also is not, being part autobiography, part journalism, and part testimonial. As a manual for freedom fighters, it emphasizes the need for collaborative and collective action against seemingly insurmountable forces. Those forces now include the internet, which as Maria, as Maria documents with both precision and profound dismay, has morphed from a medium that once held all kinds of liberative promises into a medium for mass deception and targeted assault. She draws her counsel not from some esoteric guru or academic paradigm, but from some ba very basic values that have informed her own life. The honor code she followed in school and the golden rule. That's what I lay out in this book, she says, an exploration into the values and principles not just of journalism and technology, but of the collective action we need to, to take to win this battle for facts. This journey, journey of discovery is intensely personal, a personal lesson that that's why every chapter has a micro and a macro, a personal lesson and the larger picture. You will see the simple ideas I hold, to, hold on to in order to make what have, over time, become instinctive but thoughtful decisions." Unquote. It's this constant back and forth between the personal and the political, and at some point they become inextricably fused, that forms the fiber of Maria's narrative and gives it strength. Her convictions are grounded in personal experience. They have not been paid for as the hacks in the journalistic trade, I don't think I need to name names, will allege seeking to bring her down to their own level, except in the coin of personal suffering under the constant threat of imprisonment and violence. But we learn from this book that trauma is nothing new to Maria. We also learn that Maria Ressa wasn't the name she was born into, but to find out her birth name, you'll have to buy the book. <laughs> from her abrupt relocation from Manila to America at the age of 10, to her journalistic immersion in the horrors of conflict and disaster in Indonesia and Ormok, the book chronicles Maria's quest for truth, meaning, and purpose in her life and that of others. She stresses the importance of remembering the past to make sense of the present, quoting T.S. Eliot's phrase, the present moment of the past. I began to realize that the work of art you're creating is your life, she says, that the person you are today has been created by all your past selves. The person I am is an act of creation. I can seize the past and transform all I have learned and turn it into something new. I control who I am 
and who I want to be. And so can we, she seems to suggest, even in these times of high anxiety, when we can see the vultures hovering over such once sacrosanct treasures as our pension funds, while billions more go to feed the dogs of an increasingly untenable counterinsurgent war. The big words we have become used to tossing around, truth, freedom, reason, justice, democracy, they all come down to a personal choice to do the right thing and the courage to do it. Good journalists lean on the side of evidence, on incontrovertible facts, she reminds us. Good journalism is a professional discipline and judgment exercised by the entire newsroom operating under strong standards and an ethics manual. It means having the courage to report the evidence even if it gets you in trouble with the powers that be. The words impartiality and balance are dangerous when used outside this context, often hijacked by those with vested interests." Unquote. And nowhere is this matter of choice more evident than in the fact that Maria is here with us today, having willfully subjected herself to our brand of justice, however imperfect it may be, instead of escaping to the safety of America or another haven which her dual citizenship, if not her celebrity, can certainly afford her. She will see her own story through to the end, in the locale where it matters, among the people to whom it matters most. Now, I've often remarked, as a creative writer and professor of literature, that in this country, the writers most in danger of political persecution and retribution are really not fictionists or poets like me. Not since Rizal has a Filipino novelist been shot dead for what he wrote. For sure, we have lost many brilliant writers to the struggle for freedom and democracy. Eman Lacaba, and most recently, Lorena Tariman, and her husband, Erickson Acosta. But they were killed by the state, not for what they wrote. The state is illiterate when it comes to metaphor, but rather for what they allegedly did. Rather, the most imperiled writers in the Philippines, as in many other places, are the journalists who speak the language of the people and of their plaints in terms too clear to ignore. They could be radio announcers like Percy Lapid or the victims of wholesale murder in Maguindanao or high profile and exemplary targets such as Maria Ressa. It would have been easy for her to lash back at her critics and tormentors with the same viciousness. But she says, I will not become a criminal to fight a criminal. I will not become a monster to fight a monster. That too is a difficult choice and one I am sure we are often tempted to cast aside. But Maria's equanimity in the face of savagery shames us back into our better selves. It will be that kind of quiet resolve that we will need to survive and prevail. After all, we survived martial law. We can survive this regime with agility, patience, and courage. But don't take my word for it. Read Maria's book to know that we can and why we must. Thank you. Thank you so much, Butch, for that wonderful wonderful review personally i haven't really read the book completely but that that review really made me excited more excited to read the full book of maria um now before we call on maria to say a few words i would like to um, ask you all to get out your phones and log in and register to the rappler website um, we really encourage you to register to the website because you can access content that would link you to the other to the other to the other loyal readers and communities of the Rappler community. 
because you know aligned with our mission to create um, communities of action we want to nurture a more meaningful relationship with you through events campaigns and um, calls to action that you can join so if you direct your uh, eyes to the screens here in front um, this is how it would look like the Rappler page on desktop but on mobile just go to rappler.com and then click the icon at the upper right corner of the website um, it will be a person icon for for the desktop version but for the mobile version it will be two horizontal two horizontal lines so just click that and then click register and then click create an account once you click create an account all these details will appear so just put the necessary details and um, once you're done click again the button that says create account all right so i will give you some time to fill out the details for that um, and then after after you're done registering for this one you may receive an email asking you to verify your registration so just um, so just confirm your registration through that link. And that's it. All right. So are we done? Do we have a guest already uh, done registering for the website? It's fairly easy, right? All right. Thank you so much. Um, once you go to the Rappler website again, you will you will already be signed in, so no need to do it again. So now we will be calling on a veteran journalist and um, former <laughs> veteran journalist and former communication secretary Ricky Carandang for a Q and A portion with Maria. ANC anchor. Did somebody call me a journalist? <laughs> really? Hey, hi. I haven't seen her in years. I haven't seen many of you in years, so it's nice to see all these so faces. Many. Hello, everybody. Okay, taking uh -oh. off from what Butch said. Butch, a, thank you, Butch. Butch, <laughs> there's a really relevant question from your talk that I'm sure everybody's dying to know the answer to. And it's a burning question. Okay. What's George Clooney really like? <laughs> so I have to tell you, oh, she's right? she's taking it seriously. Okay. Yeah. All right, no, go, go, go. No, because, you know, I wrote, so I wrote 400 pages, double what was here. And... Every instance of mention of anecdote of George Clooney was cut out by the editor except one. So there's a lot of stuff. I mean, he's really cool. <laughs> <laughs> okay, no, but going back to, you know, I, I got a copy of your book about three hours ago, went through it really quickly. And one thing I noticed, you took a different approach here. Uh, those of you who've read Seeds of Terror, her first book about Al-Qaeda in Southeast Asia, it was pretty much straight reporting, right? There was a lot of analysis, a lot of reporting of events. But in this book, you took a very personal tone. I did. You talked about your early childhood. You talked about a lot of things that maybe a lot of people didn't know about. Why did you take that very, very almost memoirish approach to this, to this particular work? I think it became personal at a certain point. Actually, I know the moment when it became personal. When I got arrested and held detained overnight, I was like, I'm arrested. Okay, let me see where this goes, right? And then when I was held overnight on purpose, um, and these are things that shocked us at Rappler, uh, I, I moved from being a journalist to a citizen. I am a citizen. And I do not deserve to be treated like this. And that's when I thought, okay, then this is something beyond journalism. I mean, that's the first thing when I was listening to Butch speak. It's so uncomfortable to, to hear about yourself. Or when, if you guys remember, I remember the date when President Duterte attacked me specifically, July 8th, <laughs> 2020. Um, Journalists want to step back so that we can tell the story. But what happens when you become the story? We at ABS certainly knew that, right? What happens when you become the story? Well, you can't shy away from it. So for me, it was own it. Okay, it's my story then. And this is how I dealt with it. So you guys, if you read the book, I mean, take a look. at It's not just about 
what happened to Rappler. It's really Maria's story, and it's really interesting, it's really compelling, and it's actually even more relatable, right, than if you were to write a very analytical piece about what was going on. I mean, we'll get to that, but I just want to dwell on this for a little bit because, you know, it wasn't what I was expecting to see from, oh, from your so book. Oh, I'm so happy. I was happily surprised. It's really <laughs> compelling reading. What? I'm happy. Thank you, Ricky. So, I mean, let's go back to um, the issues, right? I, I, I was struck by something you said. You said that Facebook today, and you said Facebook in particular, represents one of the biggest, the gravest threats to democracy in the world. Um, can you explain that? Because, again, reading from your book, 95% of people in the Philippines are on Facebook. So that's a pretty loaded statement. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? Well, in 2017, it was 97% of Filipinos on the internet are on Facebook. Today, it's 100%, right? No, no, I'm not on Facebook. 100% of Filipinos, oh yeah, you're right. If oh, you're a few of you the out internet. there, I'm sure a few of you out there are. Winnie Kidato is not on Facebook. He is. You are? <laughs> he is. Since when? Anyway, <laughs> sorry, go. Um, well, we know this, and this is the data that's in the book, which again, that I mentioned, it's been cut in half, right? The data in the book shows you how we have been manipulated. And think about it like this. I think three steps. Number one, the whole incentive structure by design. What the, the content that spreads the most, and this is a 2018 MIT study, is lie, a lie. So imagine if you have kids and you tell your kids, lie and I'll keep rewarding you. And then lie all the time and I'll reward you even more. That's the design of these social media platforms, right? Lies spread faster than really boring facts. Six times faster, at least. That's the first. The second is, think about disinformation, which is like a bullet, right? What's, a, what's disinformation? It's a half truth or a lie, either way, right? And then the, the gun that delivers that bullet is called information operations. It's not the thing you say. It's not the thing your crazy neighbor says. Your crazy neighbor can say whatever they want. But what happens if the worst thing, the craziest thing they say that's a lie spreads the fastest? So that's now an information operation is when you attack someone, something, ABS was attacked, Rappler was attacked, um, I was certainly attacked, our reporters were attacked. And this is where I kept saying it's free speech is used to stifle free speech. Information operations changes your world. And, and the third part is be careful with your kids, right? Because this is a behavior modification system and it starts with big data. Your kids today that who are on Facebook, TikTok being worse than Facebook, right? and I'll go back to TikTok, ask me about TikTok, but um, what happens with behavior modification, right? If they get, if it, the platform by design divides and radicalizes. So if they click something, um, Rappler is liar, is a liar they click that, the next recommendation will be even more extremist than that. So, ah, this is not like media, which delivers content to you. The biggest problem we face is that this social media platforms literally change what you think through your emotions. And now, I'll, I'll end with just this one thing, right? This, a biologist who studied emergent behavior in ants crystallized what we're going through. It's, it's the greatest crisis, he said, is our paleolithic emotions, our medieval institutions, and our godlike technology. Dami kong sinabi, di ba? Pero, yeah. <laughs> nasa libro siya lahat. <laughs> well, okay, I, I get what it's doing to us. But you gotta ask why. Is Mark Zuckerberg staying up at night thinking, how am I going to destroy human civilization? Well, that's what he's done. But, but that, is no. that like the motivation? Or no, does he the just motivation? Want clicks? Money! Guys, 
It's about power and money. Because this business model didn't even have a name until 2019 when a Harvard professor wrote surveillance capitalism. The business model, so if you're on Facebook, essentially everything you post is scooped up by machine learning and that creates a model of you that knows you better than you know yourself. Stop thinking model, because that's a distancing word. Think clone. So we have been cloned, and artificial intelligence takes all of our clones, and that is the mother load database for micro-targeting. Micro-targeting is not the old advertising of traditional media. Micro-targeting is insidious manipulation. It's like I told you my deepest, darkest secret, Ricky. Then Ricky went out to you and said, who is the highest bidder? Who will pay me the most for this deepest, darkest secret of Maria? That is what we're on, right? So the, it's a very harmful feedback loop that the social media platform, and for the Philippines, Facebook is that. But again, TikTok. The other last part is it's extremely addictive, right? A, a chemical called dopamine increases when you're on it. You notice you can't get off. So... This is TikTok. If you're on TikTok, you know that, and there are 39 million Filipinos on it. If you're on TikTok, the Chinese company that made this, ByteDance, actually has two different codes. The first code is the one for China, only for China. And that code, if you're 14 years old and below, it kicks you out after four hours. So there's a limit to how long you can stay on TikTok if you're in China. And it has educational videos because they know how addictive this is. Do you ever notice Silicon Valley's kids? They don't. They are not on the platforms they built. So there's the Chinese version. A friend and I were talking about this and he said it's like they kept the, span the spinach version of TikTok for Chinese and then they exported to the rest of us the opioid version, right? It is that addictive. Be careful. So, so just to be clear, the business model is they get you engaged, meaning that you're clicking and reading and reacting. And in the process of doing that, they get all your data. And they sell it to advertisers. So it's all commerce. It's, it's not just commerce. It is they do more than get your data. Because you think, like, you know, I'm going, you're, they're going to get the, the video from today. It's... They create and anticipate your clone, Ricky. So when they clone you, that is your, your deepest secrets. That is, I mean, a society that has no privacy is, cannot have a democracy, right? So this is, that's the danger in this. And frankly, I've just spent a month in Europe and the United States talking about the need for legislation. I wish... We can do. We can talk about this. But oh, we are. We're going to talk. Actually, I was about to ask you. So you have this huge problem. You have what you called on Stephen Colbert um, surveillance capitalism, and and that's what we are. We're the product. We're being sold, and and some people are using that for political purposes, and it's un it's uncontained. So what? And you talked about this towards the end of your book. You got to read the end of the book. So you got to read the whole book. But you talked about some suggestions for different international bodies. You had some suggestions for government. Can you talk a little bit about that? So is there anything we can do about it? I think, so there is a lot. The first is be aware that you're being insidiously manipulated. But, but last September, this is something you would have seen. Dmitry Muratov and I, the, we were given the Nobel Prize last year we released, along with 10 other Nobel laureates and about 150 different organizations, a 10-point action plan. It's kind of like at a constitutional level for countries around the world because we're coming to the end. I think the next two years, when we look at the data, are crucial for us, right? Three basic buckets in that 10-point action plan. The first is we have to stop the business model, stop surveillance for profit. And four things come into here, antitrust, data privacy, user safety, content moderation being the last. The second is stop coded bias. And what do I mean by that? Um, a f there was a film in 
this would have been January 2020. It's called coded bias, where a, a kind of a woman, her name is Joy. She was a student at MIT. She's from Kenya, and she was do she was assigned an AI exercise. She couldn't do the AI exercise because she was a woman and she was black. And she finally got to do it when she put a white mask on. So if you're marginalized in the real world, the way these platforms are coded, you're further marginalized in the virtual world, meaning being a woman, LGBTQ+, anyone who is the them in the us against them. The third, and this is for us journalists in the audience, thank you, you guys, for holding the line. Um, journalism as the antidote to tyranny. Because, please don't call us influencers, no offense against influencers, but you know, journalists are trained to stand up to power. And that's what we need. We need to continue doing that. But, but like, how, how do you go about doing that? I mean, you can't expect everyone to be self-aware, right? I mean, it's just not gonna happen. Is there like something we can do here in the Philippines or, okay, you were talking about um, marginalized people from a, I think from a more American context, but is there meaningful legislation that's on the table now, uh, either here or in the EU or in the US or wherever? Yeah, here, no, not yet. And I'm looking forward to what our lawmakers can do. I think they need to look at the technology, not at content. That's been the biggest problem. In the United States, the, these tech companies spend $70 million on a lobby that makes you say misinformation is the same as disinformation. It's not. Disinformation is information warfare. It's information operations. Um, the best of the legislation that is coming out is in the EU. It, there's, this is coming out spring 2023. You have the Digital Markets Act and the Digital Services Act. And what makes this good is that we're not talking about content. We're talking about the algorithms of distribution. We're talking about the data, right? So think about it like, like the, this is a river and there's a factory throwing pollution into the river. And most of the time, most of the discussion is down at the river level where someone says, let's scoop a glass of water and clean that glass and then you throw it back in. That's the whack-a-mole content moderation game. You know, when Facebook came out with the Facebook oversight board, that's a denial and a deflection. They just took this. I mean, who cares about the content? It's about the distribution. It's about the fact that lies spread faster, right? So we move away from scooping up glasses of water and trying to clean up the water and go up to the distribution, the algorithms of distribution, and then go further up, close the factory itself. Congress, right now, our Congress, is in the process of deliberating a digital taxation bill. So they, there's, digi there's billions of dollars in tr digital transactions happening here in our country. And um, the government wants a piece of that in terms of taxation. I'm wondering if that is an opportunity to introduce legislation. So we're gonna tax you, at the same time, there's gonna be certain controls, or, or I don't know. I think we need to, and I, this is an appeal to our lawmakers, because I saw this happen in both Europe and the United States. The level of comprehension of technology and data needs to ramp up, and, I, and that's part of the reason I hope that the book will, will show that, right? Like, we're, we are so far, the discussion of lawmakers do not take into account data and technology. It's very personal, it is very content driven, it needs to kick up. And I think that every, every Filipino will want this because we have been the guinea pigs. This is what the Cambridge Analytica whistleblower said, Chris Wiley, right? Remember Cambridge Analytica? The country that had the most number of compromised accounts because they were the target was America. The country that had the second most number of compromised accounts was us because they tested the tactics of manipulation here and when it worked, they ported it to the West. We were the guinea pigs. 
So who wants to be a guinea pig? This is something our lawmakers can get behind, right? But it needs to go beyond. There has to be an appreciation of big data and technology. Ricky, you should, how, how do we do this? Well, Justice Carpio, who's here somewhere. Hello, Justice Carpio. Hi, Justice Carpio. Justice Carpio has a proposal uh, of, about how we might be able to address it. And the idea is to, before you open a, uh, an account on a platform, you need to disclose your real identity. That way, if I want to sue you for libeling me, Facebook has to either give up his name or get sued themselves. It's, a, it's not a tech solution, but it kind of um, sneaks in through the back door. Yeah. Do you have an, I, I know I just told you that. I don't, no, 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 I, I'm aware of it. But you know, again, that doesn't address the design problem. It is by design a lie machine. So think about it. Like if we are being told to lie for greater distribution, what societies do we build? Right? That's the core problem that we needs to get stopped. And how do you stop that? You put laws in place. This has happened before in history. In the 19th century, 18th, 19th century, it was the age of industrialization, and humans were commodified. It was labor. And that was when we had the factory lines. That was when you had sweatshops and you had child labor and what did governments globally do they created laws what did labor do they organized right today the human commodity is our attention our emotions and we are not protected so anything else that you do will be far down and even something like that, you know, getting rid of anonymous accounts. We will debate that and we will spend time debating that. But the actual problem is still, do we want to live in a world where lies are rewarded? It turns everything upside down and it has an impact psychologically, sociologically in groups. And then as a species, this is shaping who we are becoming. I, I get the Facebook part, and I, I more totally than Facebook now, right? It would be all the yeah. social media. Yeah. So I was about to go into that. I mean, it's not happening so much here, but if you look at you know the U.S., it's not just Facebook that's spreading this misinformation. It's can I say this in front of a lot of journalists? It's Fox News. It's Newsmax. It's the Republican Party. Forgive me for the Republicans here, but isn't that true? I mean, it's not just them, right? Even if you took Facebook away. You still have this hate machine. So again, I go back to, yes. So if this is the original failure, the cascading failures are here. Where does, let's take the stop the steal, the big lie in the United States that brought out violence on January 6, right? On Capitol Hill, never happened before. And all those people are just getting prosecuted now, right? Why do they believe it? Because the machine allowed them to get targeted and it changed what they believed and they acted in the real world and they were violent, right? So online violence is real, real world violence. What happened? You can't, well, I guess part of it is all of those things. Media becomes a cascading failure. Think about it like this. Any news organization here, if you are in the digital age, you will compete for page views. What gets the most page views on these social media platforms? Salacious, sensational, lies, more lies laced with anger and hate. This is why you have exponential growth of a company like SMNI, right? Lies laced with anger and hate. So this is not about just the cascading failure of media, right? Like, again, who will take advantage of this system? Anyone who wants to lie. People who have no conscience. And that isn't the world we want to live in. I'll, 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 I'll do one last thing. I think Facebook's problem when it was facing the gatekeeping role, because they took it away from journalists, and when they looked at it, they didn't look at it like news organizations where you would still say, okay, the Republican Party is lying more. What they did is, because the Republican Party is in power and I need market access, let's not say it. 
that's not the way the public gatekeepers should work. That's why we don't have facts. And when you don't do that, you make everything gray and ultimately people don't know what to believe. It's harder to, and I'm not saying journalists are blameless, but what we've seen, the stop the steal, I'll, I'll end with that one again, right? It was seeded on RT on Russia Today, August 2019. It was mainstream. What I mean by seeded is, you know, election fraud, the meta narrative was seeded on RT, picked up by Steve Bannon on YouTube, and then picked up by Tucker Carlson. That brings us to October uh, that's what 2019. I mean, right? It, it's but where was it seeded? Again, I'll go back, right? Because the cascading failures happen because this is where the poison enters. So that's, anything else is a distraction. If we stop this, then we can begin to rehabilitate. A, a Russian KGB agent, chairman, he was chairman of the KGB, Yuri Andropov, he said, disinformatia, disinformation is like cocaine. You take it once or twice, you're okay. But if you take it all the time, you become a changed person. We have been taking cocaine all the time. How ironic, in the middle of a brutal drug war. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I have, uh, I have a few minutes left, and I wanted to ask you this, because um, a lot of the things that Rappler and you went through happened during the Duterte administration. And a lot of shit happened during that administration. And, you know, during this election, everybody was scared. Everybody's worried. Is this going to be the continuation? And I'm wondering, um, because the new administration, this is a discussion that's going on in business circles. It's going on in political circles. They're not killing people. They're not, as far as I know, not intimidating the journalists. Are we... Is the danger over? I mean, what's your assessment? Oh my gosh. Well, Ricky, we, many of us in this room have spoken about this in different ways, right? Uh, I think, let's talk Rappler, and I'll tell you the positives. In February of 2018, Pia Renata and I, and I don't even go to the palace, were banned from the palace arbitrarily and then our reporters started getting banned from any Duterte coverage by the time President Duterte was out of office no Rappler team could go anywhere near him anywhere around the world under President Marcos while the campaign gave Leanne Buon a tough time along with other reporters President Marcos has allowed us back in the palace oh wait so we filed a case at the Supreme Court for prior restraint during this time. We never got a response to it, so it's still there. Now under President Marcos, uh, our reporter is back in the palace. Um, she traveled, uh, Bea Kupin traveled for the UN General Assembly with, with, the, with President Marcos. We went to Cambodia. So there are these incremental improvements, but I think Part of it is that we can't be, don't forget this is still, it's like the US midterm elections. They kept saying, oh, it's not so bad. Well, it's still death by a thousand cuts, right? We must be vigilant and we must guard our rights. So I'd say, I still feel like this administration has traveled more. President Marcos has traveled more in his first hundred days than any other Filipino president. So he cares about the rest of the world. He cares about the economics. And I hope, for all of our sakes, that he does very well and that it is much better. I will say that the Duterte administration brought the level of public discourse and violence so low that we had to get better. So in other words, what, the bar was so low? <laughs> anyway, are there any questions from you guys? Do you guys have questions? Don't be shy. Hi, for those, for those who have questions, just kindly lined up here in the center aisle so you can ask your question. There or just raise way. your hands and then I'll call on you. While you're, while you're doing the questions, my, my niece is... I forgot to say, this is the first book signing my parents are at. My, my mom and my dad and my sisters are here. Stand, 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 mom and dad. Stand, stand up, guys, stand, stand up. Stand, mom and dad. Yeah. <laughs> 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 
And yes, I am Filipino. <laughs> what? No questions, guys? Members, for, members of the media can there, also There, there, Ernie. Up. Ernie has a question. Somebody give him a mic. Ernie. Hi. Uh, first of all, can I, can I have two more books? <laughs> yes. <laughs> They will, they will open the book sales afterwards. I think they wanted to make sure that, the, that, that you had the And then, um, how, how was your court case doing? It's so nice to see you again, Ernie. Uh, ongoing, TBD, like the administration. Um, uh, as you know, every day, Rappler navigates between doing well and getting shut down. So, so it's a, it forces us to be very agile. We can get shut down or we can keep do going and keep growing. Ah, where are the court cases? Um, the shutdown order has moved forward. We've appealed it. Our lawyers are here. Thank you, lawyers who have kept us. Where open. are the lawyers? Stand I'm up, guys. Name her. Patty. <laughs> Stand. Um, you know, ACRA, FLAG, these are our lawyers, Desierto and Desierto. Um, I think the one, we have five tax evasion charges that were filed six months after we were named a top corporate taxpayer, which was really fun. Uh, and then, of course, the cyber libel case, which is now at the Supreme Court. And that's all I can say about that case, because in order to be able to travel, the number four clause in it is a very broad restriction on what I can say. So you should just read Rappler. Any more? Oh, wait. So the quick yes, answer, sir. Ernie, is that I do not know. We're still on quicksand, and we just keep going. The key part is, like, they hang a Damocles sword over your head. You bat it away, and you go. And the other, the other question? Kindle. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Ricky. Uh, hi, Maria. Hello, uh, sir. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I represent the education sector. We are seeing a major problem by the fact that not only everybody in this country holding this in the palm of his hand, this has also become the main thing our students and the public read. Yeah. Yeah. Media is beginning to lose its influence. Yeah. I used to read the Inquirer cover to cover, and so did a lot of people. But if you see the Inquirer today, it is no longer the Inquirer of years back. And the same is true with media almost everywhere else, because this has become the only instrument our students read on. And the main problem here is that nobody vets what goes in this. Lies. It can be the best instrument in the sense that you can access the most noble and greatest books in the world. But you can also access the garbage and the hate and the lies that you speak about. Our education system is not geared to deal with this problem because even our own faculty have had a difficult time to trying to distinguish between what is true and what is not. It used to be that when Walter Cronkite in 1968 said after the Tet Offensive that they had lost the Vietnam War, America listened. Today, this is the main arbiter. How do we fight against it? How do we even train our teachers to teach our students to disregard 90% of the garbage that's in here? So I guess the, in a way what he's saying is there used to be gatekeepers to public opinion and yeah. now it's free for all. Yeah. Well, I, I would say more than free for all because it's insidious manipulation. So one of the things, 
I think very early on, you know that I no longer have an editorial role in Rappler, right? Our new, ex our executive editor, Glenda Gloria, took over in 2020, and then everyone has shifted up. But the reason why is I've spent most of my time on legislation. Because think about it like this, this cell phone with the apps you have is as dangerous as alcohol. And we put age limits, oh my God, the kids are not gonna like me when I say this, but you know, there are age limits. You can't buy alcohol when you're a certain age. So the problem is that when folks are young, in an attention economy, our kids, the next generation, will keep scrolling. But this is a time suck. It doesn't give them anything for the time they spend on it, except it lets them curate their lives, right? Very performative life. How do you find meaning when you're performing all the time? And you do it for a crowd that can turn into a mob like this, right? This is the world we're creating for our kids. That's why, you know, sir, it is, it is imperative legislation comes in. In the meantime, what do we do? So, of course, the long-term solution is education. The medium-term solution is legislation. The short-term is just us. This is what I've been saying. It's almost, in the Nobel lecture, I called it a person-to-person -person battle for democracy, a person-to-person -person defense of democracy. With the Russian invasion of Ukraine, I went further saying that, you know, you think about war, about war as something out there, Russia and Ukraine, it's happening in Ukraine, but War is happening now in your, in your own mind, in your emotions. It is, a, it is hand to hand combat. So you must be aware of your family, right? This is dangerous. Oh my God. And of course, we are all on, I mean, Rappler is on every single social media platform. It is, it's a hard time where it's truly creative destruction. I mean, I tell my nieces all the time who lo love TikTok, and I'm going, please don't, right? Hi, TikTok. Yes, we're also partners with TikTok. So, you know, in the short term, we each have to form these communities of action where the data, hopefully the book will give you more of this data. Uh, it's in Rappler, but given that we're distributed on social media, the stories with data, never get wide distribution. You're bored by them, but they're there. Is there a question from the back, ma'am? Hi, yeah, my name is Rebecca. I'm a reporter from the Washington Post. Congratulations on your book. Hi, I'm really, Rebecca, thank hi. you. Uh, I'm really excited to read it. You've mentioned a few times now the importance of legislation. Um, I'm curious to know- Sorry, a little louder, please. Yeah, sure thing. Um, I'm curious to know what you think. Uh, recently, uh, many governments, many of them authoritarian in Southeast Asia, have passed legislation purporting to counter fake news, disinformation on social media platforms. Um, with the DMA and the DSA, there are concerns that you know, variants of it, versions of it, will be spread across the world to curb free speech rather than uh, to empower it. I'm curious to know what you think about that tension it seems to me like a complicating factor in, in trying to pass meaningful legislation. I didn't get the last so I think uh, what you were saying, correct me if I'm wrong, there's been legislation passed in different parts of the world uh, to, to control disinformation or misinformation. And some of this legislation is coming from authoritarian governments. So do we trust it? Yeah, I can give you a couple of specific examples. In places like Vietnam, there are takedown laws. In Singapore, there are the fake news laws. And these laws have been used to target uh, yeah. journalists and activists yeah. rather than big tech companies necessarily. Yeah. Um, and big tech is in a position in these places of defending activists yeah. and yeah. journalists. So in some cases, this legislation, these, these provisions which are meant to stop the spread of fake news are being used to target journalists. Yeah. So yes, you're absolutely correct. That would happen whether or not Western countries that actually know um, where the lines of democracy lie, whether they act or not, right? So I guess I'm just saying today, 
partly because of social media, 60% of the world now live under autocracies. Autocracies which will pass legislation like you talk about, right? I mean, for a little while, I wasn't sure where the Philippines would weigh in in this, but we never passed any legislation like this. Um, but the problem is that that already happens in our countries. You, we can't prevent, Myanmar had a military coup. Most of their journalists have fled and they're outside of the country. Russia, the independent, there's no real news organizations left there. Dmitry shut down Novaya Gazeta in Moscow. They can't. So I'm saying these instances where each country that is already authoritarian or dictatorial will do this regardless, just like media laws, just like media capture, right? But where I focus is the responsibilities of democratic states. The responsibilities, and when I say this responsibility, it's like, look at the Philippines. We have a building code, right? This building we are in, we know it's not going to collapse. Hi, Estancia. We know it's not going to collapse because it follows these building codes that protect us. There is no building code for the tech that manipulates our emotions, our minds, and shifts the way we think and talk. So I think the last part is, um, I go back to drugs because I use this example all the time. And we lived through COVID and how the vaccinations had to be tested. Imagine if a drug company came here and they said, I'm going to test drug A with this row and drug B with this row. They just come in, right? And drug B, here, you guys get it. Oh, drug B, you started dying. We're sorry. They're not allowed to do that. They would be legally liable, you know? They cannot just say, I'm sorry, and yet, Genocide in Myanmar, violence in different parts of the world, Russian attacks against Americans, Chinese and Russian disinformation. Even in the Philippines, we know Chinese informations have come in. All of this has gone through with impunity, right? So sometimes I feel like it's like a he said, he said, you know. Yes, we can't do legislation because these other countries will do the same. They will do it regardless. But do you abdicate your responsibility to protect the public? That's the core question. Thank you. Do you have a question, sir? Come on up. Thank you so much. Um, my name is Reggie Abang from People Asia Magazine. Congratulate. First of all, congratulations on your book launch, Uh First of all, is um, how does this book help uh, bonding journalists to, you know, uh, face the uncertainties, especially in this time and age, but full of disinformation. But and second, but I uh, I heard po that uh, in during the during today po that disinformation will uh, continues pa po inside Facebook and other social media sites. However, po especially right after the elections or during the elections rather, youth. Uh, especially in my age, uh, kept fighting back fake news. Po. So how do you feel about it? Po? Yung, about the youth being too uh, uh, being active in fighting back fake, uh, fake news and disinformation? Thank you so much. It's a great question. It's a great question. Um, so let, the first part of the question was about... Uh, Please remind me. The first part was budding first, journalists, right? Yeah. Okay. What can budding journalists do? Uh, learn from your book? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Let me answer that, and then I'll go back to the younger ones, right? So first, this is an ode to journalism, to, to the ties that hold our society together, to the mission of journalism. That's part of what this shows. But it also tells you that the past is destroyed. Again, to my, my friends in ABS-CBN, the past is destroyed. We have been through this cycle before, and the goal here is we must rebuild. And we have to actually challenge this. So for a young journalist, what better time to come in and create, 
This is it. It's creative destruction. The world as we knew it is destroyed. And so that's part of the excitement of it. I look at it and part of the excitement we have in Rappler is, you know, every day we try something new, right? And then we see what our audience wants. It's, it's a tough balancing act because you don't want the audience to dictate the journalism that you do, but you want to listen to them. But oftentimes, and this I knew from managing patrol, right? If you only give the audience what it wants, you're going to only have crime and entertainment. So, you know, we always talk about how we have to bring in, we have to use the sugar to bring them in and feed them the vegetables, feed our people the vegetables. Why are the vegetables important? Because that is the food they need as citizens of a democracy, right? This, these are things. So the question to you is, what does this mean for a young journalist today? You have far more power than I had when I was your age, you know? So what can you do? And the hard part is you are part of a system that is actually encouraging bad journalism. So you ally with good journalists, you create, you collaborate, you look at what civic engagement means in, the, in this age of exponential lies. Um, the second thing, and this is the upside, I think your generation, the young generation, is far more progressive than we were when we were their age. I'm a little older than you. So, I'm a little you know, more progressive than you. I know, you are. No, but, but they really are, I think you're aware of a world. That's the upside of it. The question is, what do you do with that when the country can hem you in? I flip it the other way. We are creating our country today. We, and we must do that, aware of what's at stake. It's exciting. Thank you for that. We have room for two more questions. Yes, sir. Gentleman in the t-shirt. It's nice to see you here. Hi, Maria. Um, I'd like to circle back to the personnel. Um, simple question, but I don't know how simple the answer would be. What sustains you at the darkest times? What sustains me? Um, you, I mean, so I've been a reporter all my life. Now, not as much reporting, but I, you'll see in the book, Butch captured it. You know, there are certain values I took with me from school, and a lot of them I learned when I, when my family moved to New Jersey, like the very first parts of it, when. I didn't have the cultural signals of America, and I couldn't speak English well because we used Tagalog in our, in our home. So my teachers then actually said that I was quiet for a year, um, and they kept trying to get me to talk. Now you can't stop me from talking. <laughs> but um, three values from them, from then integrating, but then I think more than anything, it was the standards and ethics of journalism. It's working with journalists. It's realizing that when you have the power, when you have power, that's the time when you must draw guidelines because human beings, we, we will, <laughs> absolute power does corrupt absolutely. And I never, I felt that the most when I was heading the news organization at ABS. I feel it in Rappler, but Rappler is so much smaller and we created it from scratch. So it actually has our DNA stamped into it. What sustains me? This time matters, right? This is it for our generation. Um, I love you too. <laughs> um, so thank you, thank you for asking. But you know, part of it is it's, for all the bad, we have to remember that this is an exciting time of creation. And we all want our nation to move forward. And how do we do that? Checks and balances is the only way that puts limits on human power, both media's power and government and the private sector. What sustains her? Nian magpapatalo. Okay, one last question. <laughs> Oh my God. Okay, I got two, and one is my mom. And you have to. 
And Angelica has to come in. Mom, I'm going to give it to her, okay? And then I'm going to give you one more since she's my mom. Angelica Can I? Angelica and mom. Yes. No, you go first and then my mom. Okay. So first, what are the perks? I have to tell you about Angelica. Uh, she flew from the Netherlands yeah. to Naga and then... <laughs> Wait, you have to listen to, the, how, to what she's gone through. She was supposed to be on a flight on Cebu Pacific. She's a, a loyal Rappler Plus member. The flight was canceled yesterday, and so she decided to line up and get on a bus and took the overnight bus to come here yeah. to, to be here yeah. today. Please. Yeah. You yeah. better give her five copies of the I book, know, okay? Guys. <laughs> no, I've been your fan since 1995 when I left the Philippines. My question is, when you unmask the truth, how did you break the psychological silence of fear among journalists, among the people who went against you? That's all. If psychological silence of fear. I want to give that question to Glenda Gloria. Cause, uh, <laughs> come here, Glenda Gloria. <laughs> Miss, so I, I'll answer, but I think Glenda should also answer this one. I think part of it is we never thought that, uh, that we had a choice, that it was that we always needed to shoot the arrow straight, and that that was a service both for the government we serve, because we do, uh, and, and for the people we serve, that we never had a choice. Glenda, I'm giving you the mic. You want to give her a mic? You have no choice. <laughs> Our executive editor, Glenda mic. Gloria. Hi. Hi. Uh, wait. <laughs> wait for my book, then I will talk. <laughs> what you will see in the book is, our, I'm the good cop, Glenda's the bad cop. <laughs> so that's <laughs> Okay, Mom. Your turn. This is the last question. Honey Karandang is someone we have worked with since probe, since probe days. Yeah. Thank you. I'm, if, I'm glad my son is there, otherwise I might not have the mic. <laughs> okay, no, I've known uh, Maria for a long time. No, I just want to put in something that's uh, very personal and very micro. Okay, we, because this, this uh, topic we're talking about has many levels, the macro, the international, and all that. But let's get down to the back, back to the basics. Family, okay, family. And I think it's very important because you said yourself that the, the core of how you started all this and what you're doing is the core values that you learned and absorbed when you were young. Uh, the reason I'm doing this is I'm a, I'm a, I have an institute called MLAC Institute, wherein our flagship program is Parenting is Nation Building. So I would like to bring that in because I think we cannot just be tyrannized by the system. Let us not allow ourselves to be tyrannized by the system, which we are, but we can still do an on the ground how to raise, how to raise our children and our revolution now is truth-telling among the children who are innate truth-tellers until society and the adults teach them to lie. But we can preserve the truth-telling of children if we do certain things in our parenting, the way we parent. So uh, I'd like to put that in so that it's all complete. <laughs> we, have the, we have the children and how now our revolution is truth-telling because lying has become a way of life in our country. So I think it's so important to push in, to push as parents, basic from childhood, truth-telling and kindness. Those are the two things I, I, we are pushing for as a revolution in my institute. So I'd like to say that we can still not feel so disempowered, we can feel empowered in our own families when we can also do the values and, and, and propagate and instill the values that are the core values that even Maria grew up with. Thank you. Maria, you want to react to that? I want to, honey is absolutely 
correct. Uh, and I want to thank our partners in Facts First, PH, which is kind of where we all, we took that, right? The end goal is come to the real world, create, collaborate, and organize. And then what we proved with Facts First, PH, is that, and this had 16 news organizations working for the very first time all together with a mesh layer that also, the mesh is after we have our families and our organizations working for facts, for truth, that you can then connect it and use an influencer marketing campaign for facts. We proved in the data that inspiration spreads as fast as anger and hate. So, Pinoy's are the experts in inspiration. We must, I think we can, we can continue. Facts first, PH. And I gotta say, other countries are looking at it and are looking to replicate it. Thank you, Maria. And thank you to all of you for your time and your attention and your questions and comments. Thank you all for coming this afternoon. Thank you, Maria.